In February 1949, the leader of the Catholic Church in Hungary, Cardinal Minzenti, was put on trial. He was accused of smuggling money, black marketeering, espionage and treason. But first, let us see how things developed before that point. Minzenti was the strongest opponent of communism in Hungary, and he was later one of the leaders of the 1956 Hungarian uprising. Understanding the Minzenti case is important not only for understanding anti-communism generally, but for understanding the 56 uprising too. Minzenti was in conflict with the Hungarian government from the very beginning, and opposed even the government's earliest policies. Minzenti was a feudalist and a clerical fascist. He opposed the Land Reform Act and the abolition of the monarchy and declaration of a republic. Minzenti's struggle for a monarchy and against the founding of a republic. Until 1944, Hungary had been a fascist country, controlled by the landed aristocracy and the church. The Catholic Church was the largest landowner and the Catholic Prince Primate was the second highest political official in fascist Hungary. Minzenti was never going to accept Hungary becoming a republic. In fact, he wanted to restore the Habsburg dynasty, which was ousted in World War I. Journalist Ruth Karpf interviewed the cardinal and said that Minzenti, quote, has never recognized the Hungarian Republic, unquote, and, quote, he told us at Estergom that he considers the Republic unconstitutional and that for him Hungary is still, as it has been for one past thousand years, a monarchy, unquote. The London Times of April 8, 1950 wrote the following, quote, Cardinal Minzenti and the Bench of Bishops in Hungary declared, Cardinal Minzenti and the Bench of Bishops strongly objected to the formal abolition of the monarchy and the setting up of a republic. They objected to the coalition government passing any decrees without the approval of the cardinal, unquote. Minzenti's struggle against the land reform. Journalist John Gunther wrote, quote, The church was a very important landowner in Hungary. It was the biggest, in fact. Though the very large land holdings were broken up in the land reform, the small plots held by individual parishes were not as a rule touched. Minzenti himself was implacably opposed to the land reform. Unquote. Ruth Karp wrote, quote, The land reform, Minzenti told us, was anti-Christian. Unquote. The liberal count, Mihail Koroi, wrote in his memoirs that, quote, Minzenti's pastoral letters instructing the priests to preach against the land reform were very harmful. Unquote. In a pastoral letter of May 24, 1945, Minzenti said that the land reform, quote, was one most severely affecting the social structure of our country, unquote, and, quote, threatens the very existence of ecclesiastical institutions by depriving them of their material foundations, unquote. Journalist Wilfred Burchett wrote, quote, Elections were to be held in November 1945, and on the last Sunday before polling day, Minzenti let loose a pastoral letter, which partly in veiled terms, partly openly, attacked everything the coalition government had done. He attacked the institution of the Republic, attacked land reform, attacked the policy of punishment of war criminals, he launched a bitter attack on the laws which liberalized divorce procedure, in the past, it had been virtually impossible to obtain a divorce at all in Hungary. It is our greatest sorrow and our most cruel wound, wrote the cardinal in his election eve pastoral letter, that the provisional Hungarian government has loosened considerably the indissolubility of marriage. What can we expect of the democracy of those parties which, without authorization and competency, presume to interfere with so fundamental a pillar of healthy communal life. The whole letter was a direct church intervention in the election and aroused the hostility of all except the most bigoted Catholics, 
or those who expected their estates to be restored by the cardinal's western allies. From that day on, despite repeated friendly overtures from the various governments, Minzenti carried on a ceaseless war against the state. Unquote. Minzenti's struggle against the state's educational reform. In 1948, the Hungarian government proposed the nationalization of public education. Until that point, most schools were owned by the church, there was no separation of church and state, teachers were mostly priests, and the education obviously was religious fundamentalist, creationist, and also anti-Semitic, nationalist, and conservative. Obviously, it was necessary to implement a separation of church and state to make education secular and modern. Only a complete religious fundamentalist could oppose such a move. In practically all Western capitalist countries too, education was public and not controlled by the church and the priests. However, Minzenti as the leader of the Catholic Church in Hungary naturally opposed the education reform. This developed into a full-blown conflict between Minzenti and the government. Minzenti was able to use the resources of the church against the state, though large amounts of priests and other Christians did not have a problem with the reasonable education reform and didn't support Minzenti's fanatical views or his monarchism. Wilfred Burchett interviewed Minzenti about his stance on the education reform. Quote, what do you regard the indispensable conditions for collaborating with the state? Minzenti replies, Before there are any negotiations, the schools must be returned to the church. Burchett says, In most Western countries, primary education has been in the hands of the state for a long time, Cardinal. In England, Australia, America, more than 90% of children receive their primary and secondary education in state schools. Why don't you think this system would be suitable for Hungary? Minzenti replies, Our church schools are centuries old. The state only started teaching here in the middle of the last century. We have special teaching orders, with a tradition of giving instruction in accordance with the laws of God. Burchett says, as far as I have understood the government decrees, I believe the government wanted the monks and nuns from the teaching orders to remain at their posts, to continue teaching, and it was you, Cardinal, who forbade them to do that. Minzenti replies, It is impossible for Catholics to take part in teaching which is under the control of a materialist government. Better that the schools be closed and the children remain untaught. Unquote. Quote, the Christian Lutheran and Calvinist bishops did accept these conditions and did have their properties returned. The government decree established the principle of state education and sanctioned the seizure of all church schools. The view taken was that people had paid in taxes many times over for the schools built by the churches with state money, but the government offered to return secondary schools. The church colleges, seminaries for training priests and pastors, were not affected by the decree. There were three conditions attached to this return. 1. The church recognized Hungary as a republic. 2. The church recognized the fact of land reform. 3. The church recognized the fact of nationalization of industry. Recognition of these three facts entailed naturally the obligation not to agitate against these reforms, none of which came into conflict with religious practice." Unquote. Quote, it was impossible for Minzenti to accept the first condition, as at the time he was actively conspiring for the return of the Habsburg monarchy to Hungary. His priests, certainly on Minzenti's instructions, were carrying out a constant whispering campaign against land reform, and in early days warned those peasants who accepted their master's land that they would be hung from the treetops when the British and Americans came. Unquote. Intensification of class struggle According to Lenin and Stalin, when the landowners and capitalists were being overthrown and defeated by the proletariat, their resistance would not diminish, but it would grow and become more fierce, more hardened, and more desperate. 
When the capitalists know that they are about to lose everything, they will resort to any means in order to protect their power and privilege. They will even resort to terrorism, conspiracy, coup d'etat, treason, assassinations and other risky maneuvers. Lenin wrote, quote, The bourgeoisie, whose resistance is increased tenfold by their overthrow, unquote, and, quote, the overthrown exploiters throw themselves with energy grown tenfold, with furious passion and hatred grown a hundredfold, into the battle for the recovery of the paradise of which they have been deprived." Unquote. Stalin wrote, quote, The dying classes are resisting, not because they have become stronger than we are, but because socialism is growing faster than they are, and they are becoming weaker than we are. And precisely because they are becoming weaker, they feel that their last days are approaching and are compelled to resist with all the forces and all the means in their power." Unquote. This is what led Minzenti eventually to ally himself completely with fascists and to even advocate for the United States and Great Britain to invade Hungary, to start World War III, to restore the Habsburg monarchy. Carrying out a monarchist military takeover with help from the Western powers was his last chance to protect capitalism and feudalism. Minzenti's Political Activities Ruth Karp wrote, quote, The land reform, Minzenti told us, was anti-Christian. Darwin, in his view, was a dangerous heretic who should have been burnt at the stake. After the war, he refused to change textbooks used in Catholic schools, which describe the French Revolution as, quote, that mob movement of the late 18th century in France, which was designed primarily to rob the church of its lands, unquote. Mihail Koroy wrote in his memoirs, quote, The government had shown excessive patience. Had they let Minzenti carry on his activities, a revolt of the peasants would probably have resulted." Unquote. Because of Minzenti's fascist agitation, a group of people in the village of Pakspetri actually rioted and murdered a police officer. Quote, Minzenti's opposition to the nationalization of the church schools produced one small peasant rising at Pakspetri. Unquote. Historian Bunkösti Arpad writes, quote, The nationalization of schools in Potspetri culminated in a brawl. Unquote. Jabad Nep wrote about the incident, quote, A bloody riot took place in the courtyard of the town hall around 9 p.m. on Thursday with one fatal victim. A former Horthyist ensign murdered police officer Gabor Takac. Unquote. Punkosti writes, quote, The next day, Catholic parishioners publicly condemn the actions of their Poxpetri colleague. Unquote. Shabbat Nep wrote, quote, The parish priest of Poxpetri admitted that the murder had taken place at his instigation. He continued to incite him on the orders of his superior authorities. Unquote. Mihail Koroy wrote, quote, One day I watched the arrival of Cardinal Minzenti to read Mass in the Rock Chapel. It had little in common with a religious ceremony. Everywhere loudspeakers were amplifying his words. It was a political demonstration, much resembling an electioneering meeting. All those who were against the new regime had united in this demonstration. Unquote. Journalist R. H. Markham wrote from Budapest to the Christian Science Monitor, April 13, 1946, that conditions in Hungary, quote, are political clericalism, resurgent feudalism and exaggerated nationalism, anti-Semitism and outright Nazism. There does exist an extreme clerical element centered around Cardinal Minzenti, which wants to restore church lands, and the old autocratic regime. Naturally, the great proprietors who lost their estates through Hungary's sweeping land reform 
cooperate in every way with the clerical opposition. Unquote. Historian Andrew Girgi writes, quote, Some of Cardinal Minzenti's close followers recently submitted a plan which entails a four-power supervision of the Hungarian army and police force, which would mean that the United States, Great Britain and France would have to occupy Hungary the same way that they occupied Germany together with the Soviet Union. He continues, quote, Minzenti's followers also contend that a majority of the people would oppose communist control with force and that the recent ill-starred plots of smallholder leaders in 1947 were a mere foretaste of what might come. These members of the Small Liberty Party and of the formerly dominant smallholders appealed to London and Washington in the hope of getting one last opportunity, unquote, to prevent socialism in Hungary. So they are quite blatantly asking for Western intervention and they are promising that the previous right-wing conspiracies were a mere foretaste and they are promising that if the West were to intervene and if there was to be another right-wing conspiracy then the population would supposedly rise up against the leftist government and support the Western intervention and the right-wing takeover. Minzenti claimed that the Republic was illegal and that the monarchist clerical system should be restored. He wrote, quote, The continuity of constitutional right seems broken. When the calamity shall have passed and the nation's sobriety shall have built a bridge to arch over the cataract, then by the right held sacred for over 900 years, the primate of this country, as pontifex and first peer of the realm, shall take his share in the restoration of our juridical and constitutional life." Unquote. He continues to say that the land reform which took much of the church's land is also illegal and that he doesn't accept it. Quote, I say this without mourning over the lost worldly riches, by which he means the lost church lands. He continues, yet without accepting as lawful actions which had no legal sanction. Unquote. Minzenti's words about building a bridge, so-called to arch over the cataract, inspired the creation of the newspaper Hidverok, or Bridge Builders, quote, set up by fascist and extreme right-wing emigres and former soldiers from Hungary in 1948 in the American zone of Germany. This journal consistently called for the restoration of the old regime, and in fierce terms, warned of a return to Hungary to wreak vengeance upon the so-called usurpers. For example, its issue of March 10, 1949, contained a poem by one Kalman Serto with this stanza, quote, When we go back to the last attack, with gnashing teeth, we won't even have mercy on infants when we go on our last attack, unquote. So clearly, Minzenti's supporters were absolutely charming, civilized, and peaceful people. Quote, His first pastoral letter as cardinal, issued October 18, 1945, just a few weeks prior to the general elections, excoriated the coalition government and denounced some of its proposals as deeply wounding the feelings of the Christian population a remark whose anti-Semitic overtones, given Hungary's past, and the presence of some Jews among the governing coalition, were manifest." Unquote. Quote, On June 21, 1948, George W. Herald, a correspondent for the International News Service, talked to the primate about the school situation. The journalist told Minzenti that Catholic schools in France do not receive state support, there is no church school in Sweden, and if there is, they would have to pay for it themselves. And the agreement with the Reformed and Lutheran churches leaves several church schools in Hungary. Minzenti replied that he was not interested in what they were doing in other churches. The Catholic Church was not bargaining. Unquote. Quote, Vilmos Böhm, a right-wing social democrat, dealt with Minzenti a lot. He said, quote, He's a stubborn, warlike man 
who defends the supposed or actual interests of his church to the extreme, but often loses prestige due to a lack of political, diplomatic understanding and tact. He prefers to support all previous systems, Horthy or the Habsburgs, rather than democracy. He was opposed not only to the communists, but to all democratic factors. His way of acting was completely incomprehensible and unwise. It can only be explained by his fanatical insistence on medieval feudal prerogatives, without any political or diplomatic sense." Unquote. A journalist of the New Statesman and Nation also interviewed Cardinal Minzenti in 1948 and wrote that, quote, He, the Cardinal, wanted Western intervention, hated all socialist doctrine, and advocated a peasant society ruled by the Catholic hierarchy. I was impressed by his reckless courage, and asked him if he wanted me to report what he said. He hesitated, but said that he would rather I did not." Unquote. In the town of Tisha Fured, the reactionary priests stole a Jesus statue from a church, intending to blame the theft on the communists. Quote, a clerical provocation took place in Tisha Fured. The statue of Jesus was stolen from the church. The statue was found by a fence and taken back to the church." Unquote. During the election of 1949, when all the leftist parties campaigned together as the People's Front, the reactionary priests claimed, quote, "...there will be three days of darkness, like in the Bible story, during which the Americans will occupy the country." If the People's Front wins the election, Hungary will become a member of the Soviet Union. War between Yugoslavia and Hungary will soon break out. The ballot papers will be marked and the incoming Americans can determine who voted for the People's Front." Unquote. And presumably punish those who voted for the People's Front. The wildest rumor stated that, quote, "...during the BCG vaccination against tuberculosis, People are vaccinated with Russian blood to better respond to communist ideals and vote for the People's Front." Unquote. Minzenti's reactionary views. Quote, he closed the window and spread out an old atlas on the table. The atlas showed Hungary of the pre-war days, the Hungary of the Habsburgs, Hungary before the Treaty of Trianon. When he spoke of Bratislava, he gave it its ancient Hungarian name of Pozsony. For 200 years, capital of Hungary and now part of Czechoslovakia, he said. That should be the role of you journalists today, he continued, tracing with his finger the old frontiers of Hungary, the bits that had been clipped off after the First World War, the changes since the last war. Hungary was a bastion against Slavdom, a bulwark against communism. She should have remained that way, and what have you done? You have split her up among the Slavs, and installed a communist government. Vojvodina to the Yugoslavs, Slovakia to the Czechs, Transylvania to the Romanians. An anti-Christian and godless government installed in Budapest. Instead of keeping us as a bastion against the Slavs, you have made us a Slav spearhead of communism. You have allowed the most cultured nation in Central Europe to be split up amongst barbarians. Was it not England herself that agreed at Munich to Hungary regaining her lost lands in Czechoslovakia?" Unquote. I had to interrupt the Cardinal for long enough to point out, firstly, that people in England blush when they hear the Munich Agreement mentioned these days. Secondly, the Munich Agreement contained no word about the Hungarians joining in with the German wolves to bite chunks out of Czechoslovakia. He said, If the great powers and nations would carry out their statements about freedom and human rights, many of the wounds of Hungary, both internal and external, would be healed. And he repeated his plea to me as a journalist to press in my dispatches for a revision of Hungary's frontiers, that she should be restored as a bastion against Slavism and Communism. Journalists and newspapers don't change frontiers, you know, I said. Frontiers are always changed as a result of military action. 
Hungary's frontiers were changed because of World War I, and again after World War II. Do you believe these frontiers can be changed again without a World War III? He looked at me fixedly with his brooding eyes, and said slowly in German, I believe there will be a new world war, and one should have a clear idea already what sort of a new world one wants in Europe. In deciding that, the journalists have a role to play. The cardinal permitted me to take a picture of him at his desk before I left him. I did not see him again, nor his interpreter, until they appeared before the people's court in Budapest four months later, charged with espionage, conspiracy, and black marketeering. Unquote. Quote, the cardinal was not content with stopping the clock of history. He wanted to turn the hands back 500 years. And if Hungary were to be plunged into a bloodbath, the like of which she had not known in her thousand years history, to restore church dominance and the church estates, he would not shrink from giving the signal. He and his followers were already paving the way for a new war. The cardinal had deliberately cut himself off from the people and from the new life that was being built. He preoccupied himself with questions that had nothing to do with religion or the spiritual needs of the Hungarian people. He was unable to give me real facts about the persecution of religion in Hungary because there was no such persecution. Long overdue changes were taking place in church-state relationships, which Minzenti could not accept. The Roman Catholic Church had always played a dominant role in Hungary's affairs. All Hungarian kings, from the time 1,000 years ago when Stephen was crowned by the Pope, were apostolic kings. Throughout the centuries, no important political decisions were ever taken without the prior approval of the Church, often enough on the direct orders of the leading Catholic dignitary. Various Catholic orders maintained a state within the state. Abbots and bishops were laws unto themselves, administered their estates as feudal landowners responsible to no one. Church and state were identical, and it must have been a severe shock to Cardinal Minzenti to find in 1945 that he was not always consulted when important political and social decisions were taken. In 1945, 50% of all schools belonged to and were controlled by the Catholic Church. The Church was also the largest single landholder in the country. Unquote. Before the land reform, church leaders used to be powerful and rich landowners. When interviewed, one of them, Abbe Yusht, said, quote, The communists would like to have closer cooperation with me. They asked me the other day to attend the opening of a new school. They always ask me to attend any local festivities, but I am always able to find some reason or other for not attending. I don't want to lend the prestige of the church to any of their functions. Church attendances are perhaps even better than before. Communists still come to church, and people who didn't used to come attend now because the church has become a political rallying point for them." Unquote. When I asked about specific anti-religious activities, Abbe Yusht said there were none, and that compulsory teaching of religion in school still gave the church plenty of scope to influence the children. He was critical of the Cardinal Minzenti and said the latter could have obtained much greater concessions from the state if he had played his cards correctly." Unquote. The School Reform In the old schools, which were controlled by the church and had existed during the fascist regime, quote, the textbooks were brazenly racist and chauvinist and expansionist. Their viewpoint of science was medieval. By 1947, the government had begun to introduce eight-year elementary schools instead of the conventional four-year or at most six-year schools that had hitherto sufficed for the overwhelming majority of Hungarians. After the 1947 elections, new textbooks were published by the government including works in science, which took account of the ideas of Darwin. The church hierarchy remained intransigent, and on the question of education, the cardinal refused even to enter negotiations unless the state first admitted the church's right to dominate the school system. 
Unquote. On November 12, 1947, Minzenti issued a pastoral letter to be read in all churches devoted to the textbook question. He said, quote, The government has introduced in the higher forms of the national and municipal schools a new textbook entitled The Life of Man. These schools are attended mostly by Catholic children. This book does not teach them anything concerning revealed truth. It presents man not as God's creature, but a being descended from the ape, a theory disregarded by serious scientists for some time. We understand very well why there is anxiety in certain quarters to proclaim man's descent from the ape. But we, the Hungarian bishops, defending the souls of the Hungarian children, will never acquiesce to the picture of God the Creator being obliterated in the minds of children and replaced by the hideous face of a monkey. We forbid, therefore, all Catholic parents, instructors and teachers under pain of sin to accept or use this book. These pamphlets propagating self-abuse and circulated in many schools should be thrown into the fire." Unquote. Quote, by the spring of 1948, the government picked up the gauntlet and introduced a measure for the gradual secularization of the schools. This measure included compensation where property losses to the church resulted. It included continued employment with a pay raise of the existing teaching staff, plus two hours per week compulsory religious instruction in all schools. The law also exempted from its provisions schools specifically dedicated to religious instruction, which indeed were to continue to receive financial support from the state. This bill was approved by the Hungarian parliament on June 15, 1948, by a vote of 293 to 63, with 71 abstentions and absences. Unquote. In another pastoral letter, Cardinal Minzenti said, quote, to the bitter disgrace of this country, falsehood, deceit, and terror were never greater in the country." Unquote. So in his opinion, what was happening in the country in 1948 were worse terror and deceit than what had ever existed during fascism, and worse than even under the Nazi regime of Salashi, where Jews and leftists were literally being shot on the street corners and thrown into the Danube River. pro minzenti historian Curtes writes the following, quote, The Catholic Episcopate refused to negotiate on the questions connected with nationalization, unquote, but, quote, Calvinists were of a different opinion. In accepting a compromise solution negotiated with the government, they could keep some of their schools. After the School Nationalization Act was passed on June 16, 1948, the Cardinal announced the excommunication of every Catholic deputy who voted for the bill." Unquote. Minzenti told journalist Ruth Karp that, quote, "...you understand, of course, that the Church can never and never will give up the natural right of the parents to educate the youth for God. What I mean is, that we will fight this law with every weapon at our disposal." Unquote. However, he changed his tune when it became clear that parents also supported the school reform. Minzenti said in a pastoral letter, quote, It is not a question of the parents' volition whether or not the children are to receive religious instruction, since this would be a violation of God's right to the soul of the child and the child's right to a knowledge of the eternal truths." Unquote. Quote, Minzenti excommunicated all Catholic members of Parliament who voted for the educational reform law. In July, he ordered all Catholic schools, 65% of all Hungarian schools, closed. In August, he prohibited ordained teachers from continuing their work in public schools. In September, he officially threatened to excommunicate any Catholic who criticized either his policies or his person." Unquote. The reality is that many Catholic people and even many priests were angry at Minzenti's extremism, and Minzenti had to threaten to excommunicate them from the Catholic Church to keep them under his control. Most politicians, 
including the non-communists, also did not support Minzenti. He could only rely on the most right-wing and on the support from Western governments. Quote, on November 11, 1948, a Lutheran priest revealed espionage committed by the church. Unquote. Communist leader Matyash Rakoshi said that, quote, care must be taken to separate the Catholic Democrats from Minzenti. Unquote. Quote, the priests and parishioners of Chanad demand the departure of Minzenti and stated that the cardinal was the main obstacle to peace. Unquote. On December 27, 1948, quote, rallies were held in Niragi Hacha against Minzenti. Unquote. Earlier, a popular Catholic daily paper, Magyar Nemtset, had charged that, quote, through this terrible inflexibility of his over the school issue, Minzenti not only infringes upon the rights of Catholic parents, but injures even the fundamental interests of the church. Unquote. The trial. Quote, Here in the People's Court in Marco Street in Budapest, there was a minimum of ceremony and no trappings at all. Except for the uniformed guards, only four people were not in civil dress, and they were the cardinal, his secretary, Dr. Zakar, Dr. Baranai, and Dr. Bela Ishbanki. They all wore priestly dress, and the cardinal his ruby cardinal's ring. The prisoners sat on a long bench, opposite the panel of five judges, first the cardinal, next to him Dr. Baranai, Prince Paul, tall, languid, fair mustache and the long hooked nose and blue eyes, which are the distinguishing marks of the Esterhazy family." Unquote. Quote, Minzenti and Esterhazy represented the most powerful forces in Central Europe for centuries. After the church, Esterhazy was the greatest landowner in Hungary. The church and the aristocracy were brought to bay before a people's court. Sitting alongside the one professional judge, Vilmos Olti, were representatives of the political parties and trade unions, all in ordinary civilian clothes. Between the accused and their judges, on the right sat the counsels for the defense. The cardinal looked physically just as he did when I interviewed him four months previously, but there was a change. Some of the arrogance was missing. To understand Cardinal Minzenti's behavior in the court, one must delve a little into his personal background and into the functions of a cardinal in Hungary. For a thousand years, a cardinal held the next highest rank to a king, the kings of Hungary from the year 1000, when Stephen was crowned by Pope Sylvester, were always crowned by the cardinal with the holy crown of Saint Stephen. Unquote. Reverend Nicholas Bohr, a supporter of Minzenti, states, Quote, The primate is the premier prince of Hungary. He ranks immediately after the king as head of state. He is the sole person entitled to crown a king, and thereby is in immediate relationship with the Holy Crown of Hungary. The principle of the Holy Crown of Hungary declares that in Hungary the source of all rights is the Holy Crown, which unites the whole country, people and soil in a mystical body. The Holy Crown consists of two parts, the head, that is the king, and the members. Up to 1848, only the nobility was included in the latter. Since 1848, it is the whole nation. Unquote. The bourgeois revolution of 1848 under Kossuth, which failed to overthrow the monarchy and feudalism, but led to some reforms, quote, was always severely condemned by Cardinal Minzenti. Unquote. Quote, Minzenti, or Joseph Pem, which is his real name, was a Swabian of German origin. Until 1944, he was an ordinary priest, and his parish was part of Prince Paul Esterhazy's estates. Ten days after the setting up of the Jalazi Nazi fascist government, on March 25, 1944, Pem was made Bishop of Vesprem, nominated by the papal nuncio to Hungary, Monsignor Angelo Roda. After the end of the war, Minzenti posed as a hero of the resistance movement because he was arrested by the Zalashi fascists and interned for four months. 
When Minzenti began to emerge as a leader of opposition to the government, he was immediately built up in the Western press as a martyr who had suffered for his faith under the Nazis. In fact, as Minzenti later told the court, and as is proven by documents in the hands of the Hungarian government, Minzenti was not arrested for political or religious reasons, but over a dispute concerning requisition of property. My arrest on October 21st, 1944, was not for political reasons, Minzenti told the court, quote, but because Ferenc Schiberna, Lord Lieutenant for the country of Vesprem, had found 1,800 pairs of shirts and pants, close on 100,000 pengos worth, hoarded in my palace, and because I had a disagreement with him over the requisitioning of accommodation. For this reason he interned me." Unquote. Before the Russian troops liberated Minzenti, he wrote several letters proving his right-wing sympathies in order to try and secure his release, and pointing out that the Vatican had been the first to recognize the Zalashi regime. On October 1945, Minzenti was appointed by the Pope, Archbishop of Estergom, which carried with it the automatic title of Cardinal, Prince Primate of Hungary. For 25 years he had worked as a parish priest at Zalaigersheg, and then within the space of 18 months he rocketed from priest to bishop, from bishop to cardinal, a meteoric rise. But the cardinal saw even greater fame ahead. A cardinal has the right to crown a king. Minzenti was an ardent admirer of the Habsburgs all his life. His newfound American friends supported and encouraged his dreams. The Holy Crown of St. Stephen was in American hands. The pretender to the Habsburg throne, Otto, was living in America. The Americans would make war on Russia. Minzenti's friends inside the country would open wide the gates to greet the liberating American troops. Otto would come back. The cardinal would set the crown of St. Stephen on his head. Church and crown would be united again. Estates turned back to the noble families. Esterhazis, Batyanis, Sirakis. Life would go back to the 17th, 16th, 14th centuries. Up to the last moment before the trial started, it seems Minzenti thought he would be released or rescued. Unquote. In his letter to U.S. Minister Chapin, Minzenti wrote the following, quote, Mr. Minister, you must take action by Thursday, and I request you to do so, for a death sentence is likely, and the trial will be pointed against America. They want to prove that I was paid by America for secret information. Please send a car and a plane, there is no other way out. With warmest regards, Minzenti, January 23rd. P.S. Please instruct Kodzak immediately to meet the bearer of this letter today, to discuss every detail. Minzenti. P.S. Please promise the pilot $4,000 in the interest of the cause. I shall refund it. Minzenti. Unquote. Quote, the first to be heard in the trial was Dr. Baranai and the Cardinal's secretary, Dr. Andras Zakar. Although Baranai pleaded not guilty, expert cross-examination by Judge Olti brought out a mass of damaging material which incriminated both Baranai and the Cardinal. Baranai was a lively personality who tried to deny every charge made against him, but he could not satisfactorily explain the documentary evidence. Some sections of the Western press, and especially the Catholic press, tried to present the trial as a fake, with the accused brought into court drugged and tortured, mumbling carefully rehearsed admissions of guilt expressions of repentance and pleas for mercy. Baranai and Minzenti, on the contrary, made use of their priestly training to try and wriggle out of every charge against them." Unquote. And not only Western imperialist and Catholic press, but as we see, also the Trotskyist press, tried to paint Minzenti, the clerical monarchist, friend of the imperialists and Horthy, as an innocent victim of communism. Quote, Baranai was being questioned about a meeting with other legitimists when they selected the new royalist cabinet, which should govern the country after the Americans had overthrown the republic. 
unquote. Let us take a look at the events at the trial. First, Baranai was asked about a meeting of the monarchists where they planned to overthrow the Hungarian government. The capitalist press, the Catholic Church and the Trotskyists claimed that the accused were drugged, beaten and forced to admit to all charges. But let's take a look at how the trial actually went. Quote, Judge Olti. Now, let us speak of the first meeting at the Chekonich apartment. What was the object of that meeting? What was discussed there? Was it mentioned that you were to make reports on legitimists, that is, monarchists, working in the different ministries, and pass them on to Sandor Certo, who would hand them on to Joseph Minzenti? Baranai. This was not mentioned here. Olti. But you yourself said so in your statement to the police during the investigation. Here it is. Baranai. Are those the minutes of the investigation? Olti. Yes. Is this your signature? Baranai. Yes. Olti. Please look at the text also. Baranai. Well, if you please, this was not drafted by me. Olti. But it is your statement which was taken down. The minutes which are kept by the clerks of the court now are not drafted by you either. Baranai. I made this statement in the belief that only the minutes kept at the trial would be of importance. Olti. Then you do not confirm what is written here? Baranai. No. I was late at the meeting because of official duties. Unquote. Instead of simply admitting to everything, Baranai denies the accusation. Then he says he thought his testimony to the police would not be important, so he didn't care about the details being correct. Then he says he cannot confirm what happened at the monarchist meeting because he was late. He then gets into a political discussion with the judge. Quote, Alti, now in the spring of 1945, you prepared a plan in case the democratic state were overthrown here and a vacuum would have to be filled. Your plan named the persons who were to take power and how they were to do it. Is that correct? Baranai, please permit me to go back a little in time. The possibilities of solving the present world conditions, as everybody knows and sees that these conditions cannot last. Alti. Now, what exactly do you mean by this? That different forms of state are evolving? Baranai. I speak of world politics. I feel that the tension existing between East and West. Alti. The international political tension will inevitably be solved sooner or later. Baranai. Sooner or later, but it may well occur that the tension is solved by means of war. Well, if this should happen through a war, this was our first supposition. Secondly, if at the end of the hostilities, the Western powers should come out victorious. The third supposition was that the Americans might take over here as military occupation authorities. The whole plan which figured in my confession and the documents were based on these suppositions only. The proclamation, the list of cabinet members, and the plan to found a monarchist ruling party. Alti. And do you think it right that high-ranking clerical personalities should speculate on war? Baranai. I beg your pardon. Alti. And not only speculate, but prepare for it? Baranai. No, I do not think it right at all. Unquote. Quote, Baranai strenuously denied throughout, however, that he had actually helped to bring war about. He maintained he only made plans should the war start. He read to the court a memorandum he had sent to Minzenti. Quote, when the great vacuum, that is, the overthrow of the Hungarian Republic, has come about, the first most important and difficult problem will be the institution of a regime resting on an ethical basis. It would be a political impossibility to base ourselves on the ruins of defeated Bolshevism. Only one point of departure would carry in itself the possibility of evolution, the Prince Primate. The dignity of the Prince Primate is consecrated in this country by the traditions of almost a thousand years. According to ancient national laws, the Prince Primate is the repository of the King's power in his absence. He seems to be the only acceptable and competent authority 
to appoint a new government. He would have to appoint the new government at the beginning of the American occupation. The government appointed by him must naturally accept this decision without reservations, without maneuvers, unconditionally and honestly. Here there are names. Unquote. And follows a list of the proposed cabinet. This document, like so many others produced in court, was contained in a tin cylinder buried by Dr. Zakhar on instructions from the Cardinal in a cellar in the Cardinal's palace at Estergom. Unquote. Quote, Cardinal's assistant Zakhar concluded his evidence by relating the numerous black marketing activities of the Cardinal in bringing dollars into the country without declaring them and selling them at high rates on the black market. Unquote. Quote, the Cardinal thought he could avoid being brought to trial by a repentant statement addressed to the Minister of Justice a few days before the trial was due to start. Quote, Dear Sir, I beg the Minister of Justice to consider this announcement or request. For some time, publicly and repeatedly, there had been raised against me the complaint that I stand in the way of an agreement between state and church, and that my attitude is hostile to the present order of the state. Now I want to contribute to an improvement in the general situation. Before the trial, which is soon to open, I voluntarily admit that I have committed the acts I am charged with, according to the penal code of the state. In the future, I shall always judge the external and internal affairs of the state, on the basis of the full sovereignty of the Hungarian Republic. After this admission and declaration, the trial regarding my person does not seem to be absolutely necessary. Therefore, not because of my person, but considering my position, I ask that my case be exempted from the trial on February 3rd. Such a decision, more than anything else, would facilitate a solution, even more than the wisest judgment of the court. Please accept my sincere respect. Joseph Minzenti, Cardinal. Unquote. Quote, the court decided, however, after a short recess, that the cardinal would stand trial with the rest of the accused. Minzenti had played his last card and failed. He tried to make the best of a bad job, however, in court, by evasions and half-replies, by an amazingly poor memory when it served his purpose. Asked whether he pleaded guilty or not guilty, he answered in low, measured tones, quote, to the extent that I did commit a considerable part of the activities charged to me in the indictment, or as I indicated in my letter to the Minister of Justice, which you kindly read out this morning, substantially to that I feel guilty. Of course, this does not mean that I accept the conclusion of the indictment. For example, with regard to the offenses mentioned in Section A, I do not deny one or another part of it, but I do not subscribe to the conclusion. Unquote. From this we can clearly see that Minzenti was not tortured into admitting fake charges. In fact, he admitted as little as possible, and always tried to deny his guilt. However, the evidence was blatantly obvious. He had engaged in black market activities, smuggled dollars into the country. This could not be denied. Before the currency reform implemented by the communists, Hungary had had the worst inflation in world history. This was solved by abandoning the old currency, the Pengo, and switching to a new currency, the Forinth. It took billions of Pengos to buy a loaf of bread, so bringing thousands of dollars into the country actually would have had a devastating effect on the Pengo. Of course, one individual wouldn't be able to destroy or save the economy, but it would cause as much damage as any individual could cause. The sums of money Minzenti dealt with were large. Quote, Altogether, about $97,000 were handled in the Cardinal's black market deals. Unquote. Minzenti said about the black marketeering, quote, I realize the mistakes. Unquote. Quote, I take the blame for what happened. I have written to the People's Court concerning the paying back. I shall repay it as far as I am able. Unquote. Minzenti said he quote-unquote realized the mistake, but of course it wasn't a mistake, but deliberate. To cover up his tracks, he informed the state bank of part of the money he received, but hid the vast majority. Quote, 
On one occasion, he registered $800 out of the $15,000. On another occasion, he declared $4,000 out of $19,000. So there was no doubt that he knew the regulations regarding the declaration of foreign currencies. Unquote. It was also blatantly obvious that Minzenti had been a firm monarchist his whole life and had opposed every progressive and democratic reform. Even capitalist historians don't deny this. Quote, Minzenti, born Joseph Pem of German stock, was a narrow nationalist and conservative, but of fierce conviction. Unquote. The second charge was conspiring with the Americans. Nobody denies this charge anymore. They merely imply that the Americans were the good guys, so Minzenti was correct in plotting with them. Minzenti himself admitted this too. Quote, Minzenti confirmed having sent an appeal to British and Americans to send military forces into Hungary in 1946. In all these cases, the documentary evidence was overwhelming. Unquote. Quote, I request the help of America to put an end to the tremendous oppression and decay here, so that the unfortunate Hungarian people can be preserved for Western civilization. A solution is possible with outside help. Unquote. Cardinal Minzenti. The third charge was planning for the overthrow of the Hungarian government and trying to restore the Habsburg monarchy with the help of American invasion troops. Minzenti said, quote, I do not deny one or another part of it, but I do not subscribe to the conclusion. Unquote. What does he mean by not accepting the conclusion? They rationalized their actions. According to Baranai, they had a plan to establish a monarchy after the Hungarian government was overthrown, probably by invading Americans, and there was a quote-unquote power vacuum. However, he claimed that they were not trying to cause a war, only preparing for war. Minzenti also denied having any leading role in this. Of course, he would be the second most powerful in the country. The only man above him would have been King Otto of Habsburg. But it is possible that Minzenti didn't consider himself the leader of the invasion or the leader of a rebellion. He was more of a figurehead. Regarding his meeting with Otto Habsburg in America, Minzenti said, quote, Alti, did you inform Otto of the situation, the activities and strength of the Hungarian monarchists? Minzenti, I spoke of that. At this meeting I spoke of that. I told him I did not think the moment was ripe at the time, but it was still strongly rumored in public opinion that a historic change might come about. Alti, a third world war? Minzenti, a third world war, that is what they were discussing. Alti, you were thinking of a third world war, so you could establish a system of government here which would suit you. Minzenti, I beg your pardon, Mr. President, I was not working for a third world war. Alti. But, if you please, was there any step taken for the lessening of international tension? Minzenti. We always prayed for peace. Unquote. Finally, Minzenti was accused of anti-Semitism, which he admitted. Again, this was not surprising at all, since anti-Semitism was the norm among Hungarian conservatives and was part of the dominant ideology in Hungary before socialism. Quote, He admitted to having an anti-Jewish attitude, even as a young priest, after Judge Olti read some newspaper articles he had published in 1919. Unquote. Minzenti, in fact, was far right even compared to the other right-wing forces in Hungary. After the Nazis had been driven out, the Allied Commission banned all fascist parties. The most right-wing party which was allowed to function was the Smallholders Party. When the Smallholders, National Peasants, Social Democrats and Communists formed a coalition government and founded the Hungarian Republic, the Smallholder Tildi became Prime Minister. He represented the right wing of the coalition. However, he was not right-wing enough for Minzenti. Quote, he admitted he had strongly protested to Prime Minister Tildi in December 1945, at the proposed abolition of the monarchy." Unquote. This admission might not seem like much, 
But considering Minzenti was accused of wanting to overthrow the republic and restore monarchy, it is significant. Furthermore, it effectively means that Minzenti was guilty of illegal fascist agitation, because the Allied Commission had banned all parties opposed to founding a republic. Quote, Minzenti was determined from the first to last to give nothing away that the state prosecutor did not know. He always waited with his replies for the judge to put his cards on the table. There was at no time anything like the blind confession as suggested by Cardinal Spellman and sections of the Western press. When he made admissions, they were only when he was confronted by overwhelming evidence. Otherwise, he said he couldn't remember. For example, Alti, did you know of a memorandum prepared by Baranai for the American government to be signed by four persons, in which the restoration of the Habsburgs was advocated? Minzenti, I know of a memorandum, but I don't know who signed it. Alti, and yet you sent a special message to Baranai, insisting that Baron Ullmann should sign it as a fourth signatory. Minzenti, yes, that is so. Alti. In fact, such a memorandum was drawn up. Did you discuss it with Baranai, and what did it contain? Minzenti, after a short pause. I don't remember its contents anymore. Unquote. Quote. He tried to hedge also on the question of the Holy Crown, which was taken to Germany by the retreating fascist forces of Zalashi. Minzenti was counting on placing the crown on the head of Otto Habsburg, and he wanted to keep it in a safe place till the time arrived. Judge Olti produced a letter, however, from Minzenti to the U.S. Minister Selden Chapin, and the latter's original reply, asking that the crown should not be returned to Hungary, but to Rome. Quote, Since the cause is a very important one for our nation, and since demands for its return and military advances might be fatal for the crown, only Rome could reassure us. Unquote. Minzenti needed this crown because he believed that when monarchy was restored, he needed to place it on the head of Otto Habsburg. Hence, he wanted it to be delivered to the Vatican and not to the Hungarian government. Of course, this crown was the property of Hungary, and by having it delivered to the Vatican, he committed a crime. It is significant that Minzenti said, quote, Military advances might be fatal for the crown. Unquote. He believed that a new world war would soon come to Hungary and the crown might be destroyed, so it had to be kept safe in the Vatican. The new war, obviously, could only be the American invasion. Whether such an invasion was a realistic possibility, Minzenti at least believed in it. Quote, Minzenti's naive belief in the imminent advance of the US military forces into Hungary was reflected again in that letter. In any case, he had no business to go over the head of the Hungarian government in the matter of this very valuable and historic relic of the Hungarian people. But in the court, Minzenti would not admit that he had committed an illegal act. Alti. It shows that this was an illegal method and illegal activity against the state, wasn't it? Minzenti. I am sorry that I did not think at that time to turn to the government for help. Unquote. He claims he merely accidentally didn't turn to the government regarding the crown. He was either lying and using stupidity as a shield, or he still considered himself as Cardinal Prince Primate to be above the government of the Republic. Indeed, if Hungary still was a monarchy like under Horthy, he would have been above the government. Quote, On the question of having prepared regular reports for the US legation, and even requests for U.S. intervention in Hungarian affairs, Minzenti asked to be permitted to make a statement. Quote, As announced before, I accept the evidence before the court, and regret having dispatched these documents. The primary aim of these letters was not to expose faults or to do harm. My intention was to help, but I chose the wrong way to do the right thing. At any rate, it would have been better not to have dispatched these letters. I regret having sent them, and in the future, I shall never depart from my basic principle, pointed out in my letter to the Minister of Justice, to observe the external and internal policy of the Hungarian state in the light of its complete sovereignty. Please accept this statement. Alti. 
We shall put it on the record and shall consider its value. Unquote. Minzenti, who had always been a hardline enemy of the Republic, who had never agreed to collaborate or compromise, was now finally offering a compromise solution. For years, he had always said that it was anti-Christian to collaborate with this new government, but now his power was seriously threatened, and he still tried to cling to it. So he offered, if they didn't prosecute him, he agreed to collaborate with the government, to stop using the church as a weapon against the government, and bring peace between the church and the secular state. He had already made this proposal right before the trial, but as we shall see later, this was purely an opportunistic move. Minzenti never really changed his mind. He was always a hardline reactionary. If he was now offering a compromise, it was only strategic. If he was ever given half a chance, he would conspire against the government again. If he was ever given power again, he would use it for his reactionary purposes. Let us take a look at another interesting point at the trial, when Minzenti was asked about his plans to leave the country. Quote, Alti. And what sort of statement did American Minister Chapin make? Minzenti. He brought up the proposal that I should go abroad. Alti. And he would help you in this? Minzenti. It seemed that he would not refuse to. Alti. Do not give such diplomatic answers, but answer straightforwardly. Did he offer that in case you decided to take this step he would help you? Or did he say that he would not help you? Minzenti. Is it absolutely necessary that I give an answer? Alti. No, you don't have to answer a single question. Court procedure permits you not answering, but perhaps you are taking away from yourself a point of defense, something that it is my duty to call to your attention. But at the inquiry before the prosecutor, you did answer this question. Minzenti. Yes. Alti. Do you wish to answer this? Minzenti. Yes. Alti. Then please go ahead. Did he offer to help you get out of the country? Minzenti. He did offer, not that he would get me out, but that he would help me. Alti. That he would help you in getting abroad? Minzenti. Yes. Alti. And what did you answer to this? Minzenti. I said to this. Alti. Please speak louder. Minzenti. That I would remain at home. Alti. After this, did you not consider flight at all? Minzenti. Please, your honor, permit me to not answer. Alti. As you wish, you are not obliged to answer. Unquote. We can see the answer to this question in the secret message that Minzenti had tried to send to U.S. Minister Chapin, in which he asked for America to help him escape. He wrote, Quote, they want to prove that I was paid by America for secret information. Please send a car and a plane. There is no other way out. With warmest regards, Minzenti, January 23rd. Unquote. Quote, Minzenti was questioned for five hours by Judge Alti. He was repeatedly asked if he was tired, if he would like a break, but always answered that he felt fit. Unquote. However, there were two 30-minute breaks. Though he denied some of the charges, he was found guilty of delivering espionage reports to the Americans, of requesting military intervention by the Americans, trying to organize the overthrowing of the Republic and restore the Habsburg monarchy, of preventing the return of the crown of St. Stephen to the Hungarian government, and of black market activity. He would remain imprisoned until counter-revolutionaries released him in 1956 and brought him to Budapest as their leader. Prince Paul Esterhazy was an important witness in the Minzenti case. Quote, His crimes were mainly connected with large-scale black marketeering, but he admitted that he paid Minzenti above the normal black market rate for dollars because he knew the cardinal was engaged in a conspiracy to restore the Habsburgs and needed money for the work. Unquote. Esterhazy was much more courageous and straightforward in the courtroom than Minzenti. Quote, Alti, did you know Joseph Minzenti personally? Did you know he was a legitimist, that is, monarchist? Esterhazy, I thought he was. Alti, are you also a legitimist? 
Esterhazy. I don't want to offend the existing form of government, but in my heart of hearts I must confess to being a legitimist due to my ancestral background. Unquote. When Prince Paul Esterhazy was asked why he exchanged currency with Minzenti for a very high price and didn't use some other black marketeer who could have given him a better deal, he said he was hoping Minzenti would use the profits for funding the monarchist cause. Quote, Alti, why should you have wanted to pay a higher price to Joseph Minzenti than you would have paid to a person unknown to you, also engaged in selling dollars on the black market? Esterhazy, I thought that eventually the difference would be used for legitimist purposes. Unquote. Alti, who was the drawer of the checks? Esterhazy, on two of them I believe it was Spellman, Archbishop of New York. The drawer of the third was someone else, an American clerical. Alti, how many dollars in checks and banknotes did you buy up and later send abroad? Esterhazy, $11,000 after the liberation, 18000 before that, 29000 altogether. Unquote. Now this is a pretty funny detail. Quote, Afterwards, one of Prince Paul's employees testified in court, asked by the judge if it were true that he had taken a suitcase of black market money abroad, he replied, If you please, sir, not abroad, only to Austria. He was still living in the days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Unquote. John Gunther points out the same incident. Quote, when Prince Paul Esterhazy was asked why he smuggled financial paper abroad, he replied, We did not send them abroad, we sent them to Austria. Unquote. Quote, of the other three accused, only Dr. Bela Ishpanki, dean of a Catholic college, contributed really interesting evidence. Sleek and sly, he did his best with Jesuitical cunning to deny his guilt, but he was branded as a cheap spy, who spied not for particular hatred of the regime in Hungary, but because he was paid in dollars for spying. His career, however, was not a long one. He was quickly found out and arrested. He was recruited by a French woman, Madame Pomrelaw, who said she was an agent for the British Secret Service and worked with Mihailovic, Minzenti's Hungarian agent in Rome. Unquote. The spy Ishpanki received a package from Madame Pomerlaw. The package contained materials for writing secret letters. Quote, Ishpanki, the package contained two sheets of paper treated with chemicals, some chemical substance for developing the writing, two tubes of it, and two hundred dollars. Alti, two hundred dollars. Did you open the packet while the lady was there? Ishpanki, she opened it and gave it to me. She told me that if the two above-named gentlemen should come and see me, I was to tell them to use the chemically treated sheets. Alti, louder please, Ishpanki, which had been simply treated with wax, so that writing leaves no visible marks on it. They may cover the sheets with writing, and if they make a chemical solution of the pills in hot water and rub the sheets with the solution, the writing will become apparent." Unquote. The Trotskyist Divar tries to prove the innocence of Minzenti. Divar writes, quote, Let us attempt to sum up the above testimony. We are told of two sheets of paper, which is at one time simply waxed and at another time chemically treated. Unquote. Trotskyist Divar tries to be clever, and indeed, this type of semantics is his only argument. He has nothing else to prove Minzenti innocent. A paper treated with wax is a paper treated with a chemical solution. Or Ishpanki is simply ignorant about scientific terminology and calls wax paper chemically treated paper. It doesn't matter and doesn't prove his innocence. Devar continues, quote, On which writing will not show, but on which a neutral text can be written. We have the accused Ishpanki at one time stating categorically that he wrote to be exact, on this paper, and at another time, that he wrote on ordinary notepaper." Unquote. Ishpanki explains the method somewhat poorly, 
but anybody who's not playing stupid can still understand. He wrote normal text on normal paper. However, this paper could be treated, and a secret message could be written on the paper also. Devar continues, quote, We have two tubes of chemical substance, which later become pills, to be used in the preparation of a solution capable of making visible the invisible writing, although it was not necessary to go to the trouble of preparing this solution, because any acid solution would serve the same purpose, unquote. This really demonstrates how hard Devar tries to find contradictions where none exist. Two tubes containing pills that can be dissolved in water. This chemical is optimal for making the secret writing visible. However, Ishpanki mentions that, quote, If some official organ should have checked it and found it suspicious, it would have been enough to draw a line across the letter with any kind of dye or acid solution and the writing would have been discovered, unquote. That, of course, wouldn't have been the best way of trying to read the text, but it would have revealed that some kind of message was written there. Devar continues, quote, And finally, we have the espionage reports simply typed, and then again, they are not typed, but written in invisible ink, unquote. Devar is either an idiot, or hopes that his readers are idiots. The indictment says the following, quote, Dr. Bela Ishpanki did send to Rome on chemically prepared sheets, secret data of a political and economic character, which he had partly collected himself and partly obtained through Laszlo Toth. Dr. Laszlo Toth handed to Dr. Bela Ishpanki typewritten secret data for forwarding to Rome. Unquote. And in his testimony, Ishpanki said, quote, President, did you write the report in your own hand or on the typewriter? Ishpanki, one could only write them in handwriting, unquote. So what does this all mean? What is the great mystery that the Trotskyist Devar is unable to piece together? Ishpanki gathered some information himself, but also received typewritten information. He then forwarded the information to spy Mihailovich in Rome by writing it by hand in invisible text. If the Trotskyist Devar cannot understand this, then maybe the problem is with him, and not with the legitimacy of the trial. Devar spends all his energy in trying to show supposed contradictions in the testimony of the spy Ishbanki, who was only a small player in the trial. This demonstrates that Devar barely had anything in his arsenal. He uses cheap semantical tricks, and it ends up all being completely futile and a mere distraction, because Minzenti was proven guilty many times over. Nobody could deny the black marketeering, or his plans for monarchist restoration, or even his spying. Everybody agrees that Minzenti was in secret communication with the American diplomats in Hungary, with the Vatican, and with clerical authorities and other authorities in the United States. The only reason that Devar wastes his time on Ishpanki is because that was the only place where he thought that he could argue Minzenti's innocence, even though his argument is still extremely weak. Devar did use one other argument, though. He says, Quote, what puzzled many observers of this trial was the attitude of Minzenti. The world press reported that he stood up in court and confessed to everything. Yet on page 65 of this report, Minzenti admitted some of the acts ascribed to him, but denied the interpretation put on them by the authorities. Unquote. This is the same thing that I already pointed out, and the same thing that Burchett also pointed out. Minzenti didn't flatly admit to all charges, but instead admitted only to those charges which were completely impossible to deny. And somehow, Devar uses this as an argument that the trial was staged and that Minzenti was innocent. The Western media wanted everyone to think that Minzenti simply flatly admitted to non-existent crimes as a result of torture. But he didn't, which only proves that the trial was not staged. Trotsky's Devar has one more trick up his sleeve. He says, quote, Ishpanki is there found guilty of selling $200 on the black market, and thereby he is said to have gravely damaged the interest of the economy. This is a rather small sum to gravely damage the economy of the country. But according to Decree 8400 of the 1946 Article 20, Paragraph 2, the penalty shall be death, 
if the act has gravely damaged the interest involved in the stability of the Hungarian foreign. The same penalty applies under Article 17 of this decree. It is therefore clear why the words gravely damaged are employed in the indictment, even although the sum is so small. Unquote. Now, this is quite something. Divar implies that Ishpanki was given the death sentence for an allegedly small crime. However, that is not true at all. None of the people were given death sentences, but only prison sentences and some loss of property. Esterhazy and Minzenti, as the main culprits, got a life sentence, that is, 15 years, while the lesser criminals got a few years only. Second of all, Ishpanki was not convicted of damaging the Hungarian currency at all. Devar must have been reading the trial transcript wrong, or he is simply just lying. Prince Paul Esterhazy and Minzenti were convicted of damaging the currency, because they had been speculating with tens of thousands of black market dollars, but not Ishpanki with his $200. This perfectly illustrates Devar's dishonesty, or the carelessness of his research. Western Commentary on the Trial To sum up, Minzenti and his group were found guilty of spying on behalf of the Americans, running an illegal monarchist group which planned Habsburg restoration in collusion with American or British invasion troops. They were also found guilty of black market activity and money smuggling. This money was also used for monarchist purposes. The cardinal was also accused of preventing the Hungarian crown from being returned to Hungary. The crown had been stolen by the Nazis and had ended up in western Germany and in the hands of the Americans. Minzenti did this because he needed to have the crown ready for Otto Habsburg once the monarchy was restored in Hungary. The western capitalist press, the catholic press and the Trotskyist press all claimed that Minzenti was completely innocent. In fact, he was supposedly not a fascist or any kind of horrible reactionary, but some kind of a saint. The Western press spread such lies about Minzenti's trial that those Western news correspondents who were actually present at the trial literally intervened and defended the legitimacy of the trial. They wrote in the New York Times of February 6, quote, in view of untrue reports written and broadcast abroad about the journalists' coverage of the Minzenti trial, the undersigned foreign correspondents wish to state that we regard these charges as unfounded attacks upon the integrity of our own reporting, and we categorically wish to deny, one, that censorship of any kind is being exercised upon our telephonic and telegraphic dispatches, two, that the translation of the trial from Hungarian to our various languages is inaccurate. The fact is that the majority of correspondents either speak Hungarian themselves or are accompanied by their personal interpreters, and there have been no complaint or indications that the official interpreters who are provided in addition are guilty of any kind of sly distortion. And lastly, they deny that, quote, that the only correspondents granted visas or admitted to the courtroom are communists or communist sympathizers." Unquote. Even Minzenti's biographer admits that, quote, "...the credible charges were that the cardinal, faithful to his monarchist convictions, had suggested the crown of St. Stephen should not be returned to Hungarian soil. Perhaps he had also fervently hoped that the Western nations would agree to no peace treaty which left Hungary under communist control. He further says that, quote, it might be true the cardinal had sidestepped the regulations governing the exchange of currency, unquote. So even the cardinal's own official biographer admits a lot of the charges. Of course, he is cutting his losses by admitting that these charges are true while trying to deny the other charges. Also, sidestepping monetary regulations is simply a euphemism the cardinal smuggled tens of thousands of black market dollars into the country. You can't do massive money smuggling and then just claim that, oh, it was just a small sidestepping of regulations. The Western capitalist press and the Trotskyist press didn't really ever have any good reasons why anybody should think that Minzenti was innocent. The man was a monarchist and a clerical fascist, and it was completely obvious. 
the Western capitalists and Trotskyists failed to provide any convincing arguments, so that even regular American citizens were not convinced by them. For instance, one person wrote a letter to the editor of the Boston Herald, quote, Menzenti was found guilty of treason and lesser crimes by the courts of his country. He had been repeatedly warned that his activities looking to the restoration of the monarchy in Hungary would bring him in serious conflict with the communistic laws of his country. He chose to ignore these warnings and kept on with his treasonable activities, which ultimately led to his arrest, trial and conviction for treason. Unquote. Another person wrote, quote, What legal demonstrable proof do we have that Joseph Minzenti is not guilty? Merely reiterating that the accused is a prince of the church who wouldn't do such a thing is a rather weak way of presenting convincing evidence. What legal demonstrable proof do we have that the cardinal was either drugged or tortured into his confession of guilt? Unquote. That is a good question. The Western press and the Trotskyist press always claimed that Minzenti was tortured or drugged into making false confessions. From the trial itself, we already saw that he tried to admit as little as possible and was not very cooperative. Minzenti's biographer writes, quote, Treatment may of course involve using various kinds of torture. During the Middle Ages, almost any desired confession could be obtained by an efficient application of the rack and the wheel, unquote. It is absolutely hilarious and grotesquely hypocritical for a spokesperson for the Catholic hierarchy to be talking about medieval torture methods and racks. I mean, think about it. The Inquisition, which tortured people with racks and wheels, was an instrument of the Catholic Church. But it doesn't even matter because later he admits himself that such methods could not have been used on Minzenti in any case. He writes, quote, these instruments are, however, rather clumsy if the victim is expected to appear before a modern court in a more or less dapper condition. The impression made on the bystanders by a defendant reduced in part to shreds might be undesirable." Unquote. If the cardinal had been beaten to a pulp and starved into a skeleton, then everybody would have been able to see it in court. So he couldn't have been mistreated in that way. And if he had been tortured into making false confessions, there was no guarantee that he wouldn't reject them in court. So it's not a believable explanation. Economist Doreen Warriner writes, quote, In the Western press, the trial was reported as an attack on religion, and Minzenti as a martyr who confessed under the influence of drugs. In fact, the charges related only to his political activities. The drug explanation was discredited by the Western press correspondents. Anti communist author Ignatus writes quote, Later on, those who felt disappointed that Minzenti was not more pugnacious in the dock spread the belief that he must have been doped with a mysterious drug. I think this is nonsense. Unquote. John Gunther wrote quote, it is almost inconceivable that a man like Minzenti could have been drugged or tortured to the precise point where the communists themselves, in open court, would be safe either of the risk that physical or psychological signs of maltreatment would be easily apparent in the cardinal to all observers, or that he might recant the recantation." Unquote. So even these anti-communist authors argue that Minzenti was not tortured or drugged. The February 8, 1949 issue of Il Tempo, a Roman evening newspaper, wrote that, quote, Minzenti died and someone impersonated him in court, unquote. But that too, of course, was disproven when Minzenti was eventually released from prison. The capitalist press simply had to claim that Minzenti was innocent, even if they never had any real evidence to prove it. Professor Emeritus at Harvard, Gitano Salvamini, wrote that, quote, The charge that the cardinal was engaged in activities connected with the Habsburg restoration seems substantiated beyond any doubt, unquote. And any normal person would think this. According to Christian Century, February 2nd, 1949, quote, 
the Reformed Church, largest Protestant denomination in Hungary, issued a statement holding that Cardinal Minzenti's arrest resulted from his political and not his religious activities. This was signed also by leaders of the Methodist, Baptist, Adventist and the Hungarian Free Churches. At the same time, three Lutheran bishops published a declaration that Cardinal Minzenti's activities would have been forbidden by any government. Unquote. But what about the other charges? Well, anti-communist historian Ignatius writes, quote, Cardinal Minzenti, he had really acted as the president of a monarchist shadow cabinet in case the regime changes, and had negotiated with American diplomatic representatives. Reverend Father Boschik told me that he had known about a so-called military line leading to the Americans. How much of the charges against the cardinal was true? He was doubtlessly a frantic opponent of communism and of the republican regime, and of many a social reform it had introduced. Did he then conspire with the representatives of foreign powers? He certainly advised the Americans not to return the crown of St. Stephen to Budapest, but to deposit it at the Vatican. It is also true that the cardinal buried in his grounds a tube which contained his secret notes. It was a great triumph for the AVH, state security, to discover it." Unquote. This metal tube, which was buried in the cardinal's grounds, for example contained the documents about the monarchist shadow government. According to John Gunther, Minzenti stated, quote, I returned to Hungary from the United States in the middle of July. At home I had secret political talks and I only reported to the monarchist leaders and not the government. I convened in secret. I wrote a letter to Mr. Chapin on September 20th, 1947, in which I recommended that the United States should buy up all Russian assets in Hungary and that one of the demands that would be a condition of the purchase would be the complete withdrawal of Soviet troops. In this way, the United States, which is anyway interested in oil, would acquire an economic and political basis in Central Europe. Justin Baranai had exact knowledge of this correspondence, but wider Catholic circles also had heard of it, and this aroused a hope that the time for a change in the system of government was not far off. It was this that prompted Baranai to prepare his memorandum on a provisional monarchist government, and his list of the people who were to be its members." Unquote. According to historian Pünkösti, U.S. diplomat Arthur Schoenfeld wrote that Minzenti's political activity, quote, is based on the conviction that war will break out in the near future between the Soviet Union and the Western powers, unquote. And that Minzenti's assistant, Dr. Zakhar, told the police that, quote, Minzenti asked U.S. diplomat Schoenfeld for American occupying troops to come to Hungary, to Minzenti's question, U.S. Ambassador Chapin replied that it was possible for a war to break out soon. The Prince Primate asked the American ambassador not to return the Holy Crown. It would be better to transport it to Rome." Unquote. Pünkösti also writes, quote, Shortly before his arrest, George Bilenkin, a special correspondent for the Daily Mail, conducted a two-and-a-half-hour unpublished interview with Minzenti. Quote, the cardinal had urged an immediate invasion by British and American troops. When I said that this would probably lead to a nuclear war, he replied, it's still better than Bolshevism." Unquote. Minzenti was obviously guilty, and he was a horrible medievalist. However, in the modern day, he is praised by the capitalist press as a hero of anti-communist resistance. He is praised as the heroic leader of the 1956 Hungarian uprising, which gives a hint to the character of that uprising, by the way. Minzenti's innocence was also defended by the Trotskyists, such as Divar, and another well-known Trotskyist author named Peter Fryer even claimed that Minzenti supported socialism, which is truly wild. So no wonder that Hungarian communists strongly believed that Trotskyists were merely tools of imperialism. In the year 2019, Minzenti was declared a saint by Pope Francis. Religious Rights Minzenti and other feudalists and fascists 
of course pretended like they were martyrs or victims of pointless persecution. For instance, Minzenti's biographer writes, quote, There was a blood-freezing challenge to a whole people. Who would now be a spokesman for the aggrieved, and who would uphold the inalienable dignity of the human conscience? The shepherd was stricken. Unquote. Kurtes, a supporter of Minzenti, writes the following, quote, The real issue between communism and Western civilization is of a general ideological and moral nature. This was clearly defined by the head of the Catholic Church, Pope Pius XII, on February 16, 1949. This conflict opposes the defenders of a totalitarian regime against the champions of a conception of the state and society founded upon the dignity and the liberty of man. Unquote. Of course, Kurtesh conveniently ignores the fact that Pope Pius XII literally collaborated with Adolf Hitler. The Catholic Church continued, after this, to collaborate for decades with fascist Franco in Spain, and Minzenti's fascist followers kept dreaming about the restoration of either Horthy or the Habsburgs. So much for so-called liberty of man or whatever. Of course, Minzenti's criminal conspiracy could not be tolerated, but the government had no interest to attack the church as such. The government just wanted full separation of church and state. The church was completely free to discuss religious and spiritual issues, but it shouldn't be involved in politics or trying to push a theocratic right-wing agenda. Christianity has nothing to do with capitalism. There is absolutely no reason why a Christian should think that supporting the restoration of capitalism is somehow part of their religion, or somehow an important religious tenet or something. The communists defended the rights of atheists and defended materialism and science from attacks by religious fundamentalists, but they also fully recognized the rights of religious people. Even Kurtes admits that, quote, the communists preached the necessity of cooperating with the Catholic Church. In some villages, communist local organizations were eager to help in rebuilding the churches destroyed by the war. Unquote. And Burchett says the same. He says, quote, communist-led brigades helped repair scores of village churches and in several cases completely rebuilt them. Unquote. Quote, the church was left with more privileges in Hungary than it enjoyed in most Western countries. After the land reform, bishoprics were still left with 300 acres, abbeys with 100, and rural parishes were allotted between 15 and 30 acres. The state, even after the predominantly communist regime was elected in 1947, still offered to subsidize the church, but with decreasing payments for 20 years, by which time, the church was supposed to make itself self-supporting, as it is in most countries. The Protestant churches gladly accepted this arrangement. Minzenti himself was given a salary equal to that of the prime minister, archbishops 50% more than that of a cabinet minister, bishops the same as cabinet ministers, and lower grades of clergy, correspondingly high salaries. Religious instruction was compulsory in the schools. It was only in late 1949 that this was abolished and religious instruction put on a voluntary basis. Unquote. Quote, the government has invited the church to participate in various constructive functions in which the church and its followers could take part without any sacrifice of religious principles. It was Cardinal Minzenti, however, who forbade in a pastoral letter any Catholic youth organization to take part in the great project to build a canal between Hungary's two major rivers, the Danube and the Tisza. When the Catholic Boy Scout groups started to cooperate with other youth organizations, of which Cardinal Minzenti disapproved, he dissolved the Boy Scouts. His policy was to isolate the church and Catholics as a whole from any movement which spelled progress. Unquote. Quote, when members of the National Teachers Union were given the opportunity to discuss the project for nationalizing the schools, Cardinal Minzenti threatened to excommunicate any Catholic teacher 
who even took part in the discussions, and any parents who dared advocate secularized education. He refused to allow the monks and nuns from the teaching orders to use the new textbooks prescribed by the Hungarian Minister of Education. Priests who opposed his wishes were excommunicated. The churches gradually became centers of political intrigue and propaganda, rather than places of worship. Peasants and workers were taught that the new, the brighter life they were living was sinful. For the peasants, it was a mortal sin that they had laid hands on the property of the former landowners. The workers were told obliquely that they sinned in working at the benches of factories whose owners had been expropriated. The parish priests told them privately that they would soon be punished when the British and Americans came. In the background, the cardinal was quietly intriguing. He became a willing tool of the Americans, who would not have hesitated to brush him and his hero, Otto of Habsburg, aside as soon as they had played their roles. The cardinal's hopes and plans were laid bare in the trial, which completely discredited Minzenti in Hungary. Unquote. John Gunther writes, quote, Not all Catholics, it should be pointed out, necessarily adopted the Minzenti point of view. For instance, several Catholic groups still cooperate with the government, and one very eminent Catholic, Archbishop Gila Shapik of Eger, refused to permit Minzenti's pastoral letters to be read in his diocese. Unquote. Even Minzenti's biographer, admitted that the church could still keep its religious academies for teaching priests, etc. Quote, the former Central Seminary of Budapest is now known as the Theological Academy. A seminary at Nireki Hasha trains priests for the Greek Uniate churches. These institutions were relatively free to follow the traditional course of study. No effort was made to impose books prepared by the government. Unquote. Texts were, quote, imported from abroad through the cooperation of a central agency in Rome. In addition, subscriptions to the most important periodicals in Catholic theology and allied fields were provided so that seminarians are kept in constant touch with the best thinking and writing being done in other lands. Tens of thousands of Bibles were likewise sent without incident, unquote though he noted that there has been considerable tension and conflict after the Vatican in 1955 condemned all those priests who collaborated with the Hungarian government. The New York Herald Tribune wrote, quote, Everywhere we found freedom to worship. In Poland and Hungary, religious instruction by priests is still compulsory in state schools. Nowhere has there been an official attempt to prevent people from worshipping as they please." Unquote. John Gunther writes, quote, And it is certainly a fact that the churches are open and crowded everywhere. Unquote. In fact, religious education was not made voluntary until 1949. Before that, it was still mandatory for everybody. While Minzenti advocated Western intervention, even if it caused World War III, the progressive clergy in Hungary supported peace and opposed imperialist wars. Lutheran bishop Laszlo Dezeri criticized Minzenti and said, quote, that the Hungarian people's democracy will come to an ever deeper understanding with Christians of the Lutheran Church, unquote. Lutheran bishop Lajos Veto bitterly attacked Minzenti and approved of the five-year plan, quote, Bishop Janos Peter has indicated that conditions in Hungary are favorable for the growth of the churches and that freedom of religion still exists." Unquote. Protestant Bishop Albert Beretsky stated, quote, Our church accepts the new situation created by Hungarian democracy, which progresses toward socialism, unquote, and expressed gratitude that every possibility for preaching the gospel freely in Hungary has been given. At the Paris Peace Conference on April of 1949, he stated, quote, We must therefore stand up boldly for the truth of socialism. Christianity has long enough been a companion of the capitalist system. Unquote. Archbishop Chapik spoke at the World Peace Assembly in Helsinki, Finland, 1955. He said, quote, 
Another demand of Christian morality is that war must not bring suffering to innocent people who take no active part in it. Hydrogen bombs, nuclear weapons, and in general weapons capable of affecting mass destruction should not be used under any circumstances." Unquote. Archbishop Zsapik continued, quote, The Hungarian people, standing in the presence of its ruins, has taken up the task of reconstructing its country with all the energy it can muster, and without shrinking from any sacrifice. It has inscribed in its constitution freedom of conscience and of religion, and has enlarged the scope of social welfare. It has made every effort, even in difficult circumstances, to create improved social conditions. In this endeavor, there has been realized the rallying of all the forces of Hungarian society, from those of the government to those of the last honest citizen, be he a manual worker or an intellectual." Unquote. 